the owl and the pussycat went to sea in a beautiful pea green boat. They took some honey and plenty of money wrapped up in a five pound note. The owl looked up. Nearly everyone the knows this sublime piece of nonsense poetry by Edward Lear. Few realize that Lear had two other major talents. He was a consummate landscape artist and he was an intrepid traveler and writer of travel books. And it is these aspects of Lear I want to tell you about. Now I'm here in Corfu with the mountains of Albania behind me and it is there that I'm going to follow in the footsteps of an epic journey that Lear began from here in 1848. I'm Robert Horn, and I'm following the path of Edward Lear, artist, poet, humorist, and traveler. Lear was one of the few people to explore the turbulent southern Balkans during the 19th century. I'm taking his remarkable journal and drawings with me to find out what became of Lear's world. Thank you. This way. No, 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 no. When Edward Lear arrived in Corfu, his first book of nonsense poems had already been published. Nearly all of his poems are imbued with a sense of travel. He invented places and creatures, like the Chankly Boar, the great Grombulian Plain, and the Jumblies, who went to sea in a sieve. Eventually, his nonsense would make him famous, but during his life, he earned his living as a landscape painter, and Corfu offered him new and exotic material. Nonsense never made him rich. Lear was an unlikely traveler, very tall, clumsy, short-sighted, asthmatic, and worst of all, from early childhood, he suffered from epilepsy and depression. He was advised by his doctor because he had epileptic attacks to uh, walk walking and traveling for him was uh, like a medicine but also he liked to travel uh, in order to get away from the english uh, social life which he loathed he uh, had to participate and perform and be an entertainer in order to uh, secure clients corfu was basking under the protection of the british flag and lear had many wealthy and influential friends who admired and supported him He'd even given drawing lessons to Queen Victoria. However, he always felt himself to be an outsider, and he was uncomfortable with formal colonial life. Lear, who was by now 36 years old, was already a seasoned traveller. The life of a wanderer suited him, and he was rarely to be found in one place for very long. Even Corfu, an island that was as close to paradise for him as he could wish for, couldn't hold him. I think for all his life, Lear was a wanderer, both physical and a spiritual wanderer. He had a desperately unhappy childhood from which he sought to wander away, to escape. And this was led to the travels and to the exploration, but also, I think, to, to the feeling of being a free spirit in a world where things were very rigidly set. He, wandered across these things, exploring as he went. In May 1848, he prepared to set off for the east into a land where, as he said, pots and pans were unknown. When Lear left British waters, he passed into the young kingdom of Greece that had only recently gained its independence from the Ottoman Empire. Athens was its proud new capital. The sea route from Corfu to Athens involves going all the way around the southern part of Greece, called the Pel Peloponnese. 
which is attached to the mainland Greece by this tiny stretch of land, the Isthmus of Corinth. Lear was dropped off at Corinth and took a horse across the Isthmus and then a short journey by sea to Athens, thus saving several days. Had he waited 45 years, his ship could have come straight across the isthmus through the canal. But what particularly appealed to him about Greece, I think, first of all, he enjoyed the Greek people. But secondly, it was the countryside. It was the most beautiful countryside for him. Wide open plains, distant blue hills receding backwards. Uh, the nonsense landscape of the Great Grand Blue Limpain and the hills of the Chankly Bore, they are there in the Greek landscape. During the Ottoman rule of Greece, Athens had become a neglected backwater, little more than a village with some extremely impressive classical remains. Never was anything so magnificent as Athens. The beauty of the temples I well knew from endless drawings, but the immense sweep of plain with exquisitely formed mountains down to the sea, and the manner in which the huge mass of rock, the Acropolis, stands above the modern town with its glittering white marble ruins against the deep blue sky is quite beyond my expectations. The town is all new, but the poorer part of it, with its awnings and bazaars and figures of all possible kinds, is most picturesque. There are some very, very good shops and a sort of air of progress about the whole place. Edward Lear arrived at the port of Piraeus. He made his way across swampland, marshland, and then over here, olive groves, till he arrived at the ancient city of Athens, the Plaka, which lies below the Acropolis. Now, it's a complete city all the way from Piraeus to Athens, a plain of concrete. So what became of the people and places that Lear fell in love with? Athens is a good place to start looking for answers. This is Ermu Street, the route Lear would have taken into town. Lear would have found a new capital city in the process of creation. And even today, some of the flavor of the 19th century development is still here. Of course, after 150 years, there's precious little evidence of Lear's presence here. But I gather there's something rather exciting at this magnificent building. This is the Gennadius Library, home to a unique collection gathered by John Gennadius, once Greek ambassador to London. Maria Georgiopoulou is the director, and she has agreed to meet me. So, what we got here? So here we are. We are uh, in the flat storage room of uh, the Gennadius Library, and uh, these are about two thirds of the Lear drawings. Well, um, all of these. All of these. And when did they arrive here? They came here in 1928. Uh -huh. uh, they were sold as a group in London uh, in, at that time. And uh, they were offered to uh, the founder of the library, to John Gennadius, uh -huh. who was a very important book uh, collector uh, in London. So these were offered to him uh, to buy. And he must have paid a lot of money. What, what, what did he pay? Uh, he paid 25 pounds for them. He uh, <laughs> English pounds? English pounds, He paid yes. 25 pounds for two, <laughs> over 200. Yes. Yeah. He was about 30 years younger than Lear, so yes. it was yes. a, a wonderful way to appreciate what Greece looked like uh, as it became a modern state, yeah. as it became independent of the Ottomans. We, I mean, uh, now we value very much these kinds of 
uh, intimate, spontaneous drawings, uh, to me at least, they tell me a lot about what he saw, how he saw it, sure. uh, the fact that uh, even how his mind and his psychology worked. There are so many of them. There are many of them. That's, look at that, that's very dramatic. Terrific. And one more? Yes, please. Okay. Oh, this is wonderful. This says Cavalla, mm -hmm. 26th of September, 1856. And Cavallo is an important city, rather close to Thessaloniki. That is wonderful. And lots of the typical writing that he's put mm -hmm. on in order to remind him of what colors and what shape things were sometimes far below, it says there. Whatever that means, he, I'm sure it means something to him. It's only fairly recently that Lear's drawings have come to be appreciated. In his own time, he was considered old-fashioned, but thanks to the vision of a handful of people, like Gennadius and Philip Hoffer in America, that his work has survived and is being rediscovered. The Placa district, nestling at the foot of the Acropolis, reminds us of the Athens that was known to early travelers, such as Elgin, Lord Byron, and later on, Edward Lear. Today, I'm trying to find the spot from which Lear made a drawing of the temple known as the Thession. Where do you think this picture was taken from? Here or up there? This is from Panica. The hill is in front of the Acropolis, near Arios Pargos. Fantastic. May Athens be like this once more. So Athens was nicer 150 years ago. Sure, Athens has retained some of its charm, even today. But surely then it was much more beautiful. And the state should have preserved the monuments and the city. But the Greek governments could see in front of them nothing but profit. <laughs> Everybody's to Polly. <laughs> Thank you. Good luck. I'm now at one of Greece's most distinguished museums, the Benaki. I've arranged to meet Dr. Fanny Maria Tsigaku, a leading expert on Lear and his paintings. This whole room, it's dedicated to Athens in the 19th century. As you can see, we have mostly views by various artists who uh, visited uh, the city. In most 19th century views are uh, views of a land which is like a paradise. What I mean is a very idealized uh, depiction of Greece. Lear is completely different. I mean, he liked to paint the facts. Lear's views represent the Greece that was at his time. Lear's works constitute the only accurate visual point of reference of 19th century Greece, and this is very important because Greece has been altered uh, very much, especially the countryside. If anybody wants to capture the feeling of 19th century Greece, then one should look at Lear's landscapes. When Lear was in Athens, it occurred to him that up till then, artists had failed to capture the real Greece, and he was inspired to produce a definitive record of its landscape and people. His first goal in this quest was to visit the unique monasteries of Mount Athos. And to do this, he had to go north to the city of Thessaloniki. Lear was a great observer of people. On his journey by steamer, he made these sketches. And in the journal he began to keep, he tells us, Every point of the lower deck, all of it, is crammed with Turks, Jews, Greeks, Bulgarians wedged together with a density compared to which a crowded Gravesend steamer is emptiness. A section of a fig drum or a herring barrel is the only apt simile for this extraordinary crowd of recumbent human beings. I've managed to get a ride on a tugboat skippered by Michael Fotiades to experience what an approach to Thessaloniki is like from the sea. But today's city 
presents me with a different aspect to the one that Lear would have seen. The city was made with ancient buildings, very beautiful. Now the city has taken a very different shape. I don't like all this concrete. I like very much the old Thessalonica. Also, the good thing is that the people of this city have an amazing culture and a civilization that is amazing. They love the arts, they love literature, and I can say that is very different to the other cities of Greece, without wanting to do down the Greek world. But this city is something outstanding. Sadly, much of the lower city was destroyed in a devastating fire in 1917. Today's orderly disembarkation contrasts with the one Lear recorded in his journal. On the 11th of September, 1848, Edward Lear arrived here. On the dockside, there were scores of Jewish porters, and they started scrambling for the baggage, and there was a real fight. It turned into an absolute melee. Eventually, his baggage was taken by five or six porters up into the town, and he followed. So when Edward Lear arrived here in 1848, what kind of scene would he have seen? Small shops around the port, which was the area of uh, the Jewish uh, community, the area of the Greek uh, Christian community, which is almost around here, this way. And behind them, all of them, imposing on all of them, would be the minarets and the mosques uh, of the Ottoman citizens of the city, who were also the rulers. Three different cultures that uh, perhaps didn't mingle very much between them, but uh, they lived in peace. When Lear made these drawings, Thessaloniki was one of the most diverse communities in Europe, made up of Jews, Muslims, and Christians. Today, only relics remain of this spectacular mix of people and architecture. In 1922, when Greece's modern borders were finally drawn, there was a painful swapping of populations with modern Turkey. Greece's Muslims were exchanged for the Greek Christians of Turkey. Lear's drawing from up here in the Castro area would have depicted this multicultural community. He would also have had a good view of Mount Athos. In the distance is Mount Olympus, and to the east, Mount Athos. Today I've been unlucky. They're both shrouded in mist. Here near the docks was the Jewish quarter. Today, this area of old warehouses is full of restaurants. Thessaloniki is Greece's second city and a center for its northern culture, with a reputation for the best food in Greece. This one? Yes. And that one? And that one. This restaurant specializes in the cuisine of Constantinople, a heritage of the refugees from Asia Minor when the city was repopulated. Wow. Yes. That looks fantastic. This is cupboards. Uh -huh. And this is the one I've told you. Wonderful. Yanni's family is Greek, from Constantinople, modern Istanbul. They brought something from there. They brought their culture again. Uh, they brought uh, their opinion about life, and yeah. about food, sure. <laughs> of course, and about the culture. Uh, and they rebuilt their uh, lives here. And, they, and uh, Thessaloniki is quite different in culture to Athens. Yes, of course. Uh, it's a city from emigres, it's emigre city. Mm -hmm. So their culture, it's more humanity. 
Yes. We are more um, culture believers. Sure. So we have many restaurants here. Indeed. <laughs> many bars. Yeah. Uh, and the food is uh, considered to be quite good, I, I think. Yeah, yeah. Better than Athens, maybe. Uh, yeah. I believe that so. <laughs> and the uh, Athenian people believe that so, so they come here for it. The Athenians come here to eat. Yeah. Well, that says everything. <laughs> Thessaloniki was once the pride of Jewish culture in the Eastern Mediterranean, more important even than Jerusalem. So where have all the Jews gone? Yaakov ben Meyer, a leading member of the Jewish community, explains what happened. So what is so significant about this particular square? This square is called Liberty Square, and on 11th of July, 1942, the German military command of Salonika, the occupation army, ordered all Jews aged from 18 to 45 to assemble here, about eight to 10,000 persons. And that's exactly when persecuting the Jews in Salonika started. And your family was here? My father was here. He was, actually, he told me that he was standing right there in the corner. Uh -huh in uh, March 1943. He was taken to the camps like most of the Jews of Salonika, mainly in Auschwitz, Birkenau. Auschwitz and Birkenau. And uh, the, that was a, 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 how many? It was about, about 56,000. 56,000. And um, survived, uh, the survivors were less than 1,000. And, and your father? My father was one of the survivors. Although we are still very few, we are only 1,200, uh, we are trying to at least revive the glory of uh, the community that was here. The city's rich Byzantine heritage is preserved mainly in the form of its many churches. Thessaloniki's history has often been tragic, being, as it was for many centuries, the strategic prize that armies wanted. The Crusaders and the Venetians came and went, and there are numerous reminders of Ottoman occupation, but there are few physical reminders of the Jews. Over here is the rotunda, originally part of the Emperor Galerius's palace complex, built sometime in the, well, early in the fourth century AD. And here is his tri triumphal arch. It is here that Lear made one of his most interesting drawings. But true to style, it is the people as much as the architecture that interests him. Galerius's rotunda was converted into a church and then into a mosque, as you can see from the remains of the minaret there, and then into a church again, which neatly reflects the history of the entire region in one building. These buildings disappeared, they're not there now. How long ago was it when, when these buildings were here? Around 50 years ago, approximately. 50. So the minaret goes to here. And this bit on the top, it's not there. It was destroyed in the earthquake. The earthquake was in 1978, and it was very strong. It was about seven on the Richter scale. I remember the exact number. It caused great damage also on the building of the rotunda. And there were conservation works being done. They are now finished. And there are works now only being done on the mosaics. And these are near completion too. Well, I think that is the precise point that Lear stood 
in order to paint that picture. This is where he stood, right on this very spot. Lear's timing was not good. The city was in the grip of a cholera epidemic and in a sad state and under quarantine. This part, the old Turkish quarter, was closed, as was the road to Mount Athos. And because of the plague, there was only one road open to the northwest. Lear decided to go it alone and follow the Via Ignatia to its western end on the Adriatic. The Via Ignatia was a major Roman highway, 10 meters wide in places, built to connect Constantinople with Rome. The modern road follows its route, and it is still an important link. Lear now left the relative comforts of the city behind. It was a brave man who contemplated a journey across the Balkans to the Adriatic, into unknown territory, with only his dragoman or guide and a few horses for all his gear. When Edward Lear came here, he knew Pella was the birthplace of Alexander the Great. But where was Pella? There was no physical evidence of its whereabouts. He was intrigued by a series of ancient mounds, and his instincts were remarkably accurate, because much later, one of the most exciting archaeological finds of the 20th century was made here. I was privileged to meet the distinguished Maria Akamati, the chief archaeologist for the excavation. And I showed her Lear's drawing with the inscription Pella at the bottom. So when did you first find the site? The archaeological site was first uncovered in 1957 and the village of modern Pella was spread on the ruins of the archaeological area. In particular, one of the houses of the village was built on the big open area with the restored columns that is now on the site. And during some building works at the basement of the house, the first piece of that column was found, so the building work had to be stopped and the excavation began. The Greek government went ahead with buying out all the houses that were here. The houses were demolished so that the excavation could take place, and from then, the expansion of the town stopped to the point where the modern homes are today. Of course, the locals are not so pleased. But we are addressing the issue, as in all worldwide archaeological sites, which is to ask what communities might have lost by gaining tourist development. Professor Akamati recognized the picture, but she said it was of Janitsa further down the road and must have been drawn from the direction of Pella. Janitsa is the site of an important victory for Greece against the Ottomans in the Balkan War of 1912. When Lear came here, it was a major Muslim religious center. Today, little is left of the old town. When they were fighting against the Turks, the Turkish? Exactly. OK. Listen, do, do you know this, this place? I think it's Yanitsa. <laughs> up, up this way? Uh-huh.
and this church you're restoring? It's not, it's not a no, church. It's not a church. It's a Muslim. Ah, okay. It's, a, it's the tomb of Ghazi uh, Avrenos Bey. It was the one who conquered the whole region the here. The whole region. Long, long time ago. For Ottoman time. Ottomans. Yes. Uh, Can you recognize this mountain? Yes, this is Mount Paiko. Paiko. Where is Mount Paiko? That way. North. S north. So maybe he was over there looking this yeah. way. Yeah, uh, that's for sure. Because the, he may be near the swamp. At the swamp over there. Yeah. How far it's, is the swamp from here? You have to go down, straight ahead. Yeah. About one kilometer from now, uh -huh. you actually... I didn't find my location, but I did get an insight into how the past is being reassessed in Greece and how a sacred Muslim site is being lovingly restored by the modern Greeks. As I drive through this peaceful landscape, it is strange to recall how it has been fought over for centuries. The changing names of the towns tell the story of how they frequently changed hands. Now, this region of northern Greece has seen peace for more than 50 years, an achievement in the Balkans, and is reaping the rewards of increased prosperity. Edessa is strategically positioned on the Via Gnatia, which has to climb some imposing cliffs. Lear thought Edessa was one of the most beautiful places he had visited, with its sparkling mosques and glittering waterfalls. In fact, Edessa means town of the waters. But as I'm about to discover, the waters are more than just picturesque material for a drawing. Maria Grant Farry, Edessa's tourist officer, explains. I imagine that control has come this way and it's yes. swung back with different armies moving through. Yes. During the Byzantine time, uh, the people moved up here on the rock. To defend themselves? To defend themselves. Uh -huh. Because they had, we can also see, we have a better view from here now. Mm -hmm. When did it turn into a Greek town? In 1918. We had the Turkish occupation here for 600 years, yes. not for 500 years like Athens. And the Turkish side had, because I can see in his picture, two mm -hmm. mosques. Yes, were... we had seven mosques then. Now uh, it still exists one, but on this picture we can see two, yes. Sure. Mm. When Lear was here for flour mills, yes, yeah, flour and mills, yes, the old grinding. mills. And since then, uh, I can see there's been other activity. What happened yeah, in between? Uh, then after, they will build five factories. The four were textile factories, and the one was hemp factory. Hemp? Hemp, yes. And they used the hemp for...? Uh, they used the hemp for doing ropes, big ropes for the boats. We rarely, if ever, think of Greece as an industrial country. Yet here, out in the wilds, is an industrial plant that resembles one you might easily have found in northern England over 100 years ago. In fact, some of the machinery has been imported from England. Athanasius Aegis is an engineer whose family came from Austria to install machinery here in the 1920s, and they never went back. Now, Athanasius has dedicated himself to restoring this rare piece of history with the help of European funding. The reason why this factory was built is because of the nature of the landscape around us and the existence of the water which gives us the kinetic energy through a water mill which not only moved the machines but also created electricity, not only for the factory but also for part of the city. The factory indeed closed in 1968. Firstly, the machines were not renewed. They were surpassed by the newer technology and by different material. The so-called synthetic ropes. The second reason is that the waters were used for the creation of public electric power by DEI, the public electricity company of Greece. Uh, and now, after 40 years of not working, you're restoring the factory? 
Αυτή τη στιγμή προσπαθούμε να κάνουμε αποκατάσταση αυτού του εργοστασίου. Yes, at this moment in time we're trying to restore this factory so that we can revive the cultural identity of this city. This is of another era, an era of manual work and not automated like today's. And we will try also to give an economic breather to the city by attracting people to see and relive and reflect on how the city once had been. Καλημέρα. Καλημέρα. Um, do you have a, a room for tonight? Yes, of course we have. Excellent. It is a great charm of the Turkish character that they never stare or wonder at anything. You're not bored by any questions, and I am satisfied that if you choose to take a cup of tea while suspended by your feet from the ceiling, not a word would be said or a sign of amazement betrayed. From the outset, Lear had to battle against his accommodation, the terrain, and the weather. The typical Turkish wayside inn, or khan, varied enormously in facilities and hospitality. But even by 19th century standards, and to someone as indomitable as Lear, they were often challenging. Luckily, I don't have to put up with ah. such discomforts. Yeah, that seems pretty good. During all this time, Lear was traveling through Turkey. This whole area was part of the Ottoman region of Macedonia. But today I have to cross the border from Greek Macedonia into a new country, the quaintly named former Yugoslavian Republic of Macedonia, or Phyrum. I think we've got to stop and get our passports ready, shall we? I've just crossed over into Macedonia from Greece, and we've come across a, a really Lyresque landscape. This used to be swampy, it was full of reeds in Lear's day, tall mountains in the background, and it was a tricky road for, the, for them to come along. He had two guides from him from Edessa. They stopped at a, a khan, and both of them got extremely drunk on raki. One of the guides fell into the reed beds and got stuck, thus losing Lear a good couple of hours along the road. The Balkans were notoriously hard for travelers, including the threat of bandits. But as an artist, Lear was doubly vulnerable. Muslim religious law forbade making any representation of God's creations, so drawing was technically forbidden. He mentions uh, at one point how uh, when he sat down to draw, he was surrounded by a horde of children who were pointing at him saying, Satan screw, which means the devil is drawing. So he was considered the devil. Uh, he, went, he had to go through great hardships, and this is why most of his um, contemporaries were reluctant to visit uh, uh, mainland Greece at that time. From now on, Lear had to work under the protection of the local police. Lear's next stop was Monastia, which is now called Bitola, and the New Republic's second city. 150 years ago, Bitola was largely inhabited by Greeks and Slavs, with some Albanians and a sizable minority of Jews typical of the complex ethnic mix of the region. Lear thought the town a beautiful oasis of civilization in a desolate region. The major European powers at one time had consulates here, and some countries still do. Elena Petrovska, a guide from the tourist office, has agreed to show me round the old town. I can see on the picture that Jewish, uh, Orthodox, Turks, different nationalities are written down. 
So that was a main characteristic uh, in that time for Pitola in 19th century. And there were different nationalities living and they were living nice, friendly and as it is today. But it has had quite a difficult few years. How is it going to develop, do you think? Well, Pitola is a um, university city, it's economic and cultural center of southwest part of Macedonia. So um, uh, transition problems are tough for everyone. But nowadays we are facing a new future, better for everyone. Young people are having chance for better education, uh, more faculties open. It seems to be an optimistic future. Yeah, yeah, for sure. As it happens, my visit to Bitola coincides with Easter, and we are here on Good Friday. Nearby is Bitola's main church of St. Dimitri, built in 1830 under Ottoman rule. Religion has had a hard time in this region, especially Christianity. Under the Turks, church building was restricted and had to be discreet. Churches were often built in sunken courtyards, down side roads, and with plain exteriors. As you can see, all the effort has gone into the lavish interior. Under the communists, all religion was discouraged. But with the arrival of democratic government, there has been a significant revival. I'm waiting by Tito's statue for a guy who's um, very kindly arranged to try and find the places that Lear went to. His name's Gorky. I haven't met him, so I don't know what he looks like. Uh, and I'm on time, and I'm hoping he's not going to be too long. And it's quite cold, and like an idiot, I didn't bring the right clothes, so I'm wearing two shirts. Oh, I think this may be him. Are Hello, you, how are you, Rob? You're Gorky. Oh, nice to meet you, ah, yes. Thank you very much for yes. coming. Okay. I'm glad you came, because I was getting cold. Oh, yes, it is cold. What makes Macedonia, the new Macedonia? They, they, are, they were borders made by um, the former Yugoslavia, yeah. mostly. And the uh, northern border with Serbia was uh, formal in yes. the former Yugoslavia, but now it's a border between two countries. And also a big part of our industry was made for the Yugoslavian market. Yeah. And uh, unfortunately, after the independence, after that, uh, lots of these uh, factories uh, uh, broke down so because uh, they couldn't... Uh, they lost their market. They lost their market. But now our economy is getting better, yeah. I think. Uh, with the possibility that you may join the EU or...? Yes, we hope that we, in uh, the close future, yes. that we will join the EU. You're yes, on the list. European Union. You're on the list. Yes, we, we are the candidates. Yeah. Tito's here looking huh. golden cold. How is he uh, thought of by the modern Macedonians? Uh, I think that he did good for Macedonia because he put Macedonia as a federal republic. Mm. Edward Lear, we've identified some of the villages where he yes. made drawings. Yes. Uh, some parts of the old roads, they are still there. Uh -huh. And uh, we will go and see those places. Great. Mm -hmm. We're going to be trying to find a village called Braicino. Yes. Great. Which I think is about, going to be about uh, half an hour away from, from here. And we're, we're going hmm, really slowly. Uh, in fact, it's not even registering on the speed. Yes, it is. Sorry, we're doing 20, about 20, 20 kilometers. Fifth, about 15 kilometers, say 10 miles an hour. Yeah. Actually, this is faster than Lear would have gone. Lear would have gone a bit slower on a, on a horse or, or yeah. a donkey. Yeah. They used donkey, donkeys at that time. And now we, we use Lada Niva. Lada, Lada is mod, the, the modern day donkey. Luckily, Lear had horses on which to pile himself and all his equipment. But it is remarkable that he got this far at all. He wasn't physically endowed with the characteristics of a traveller. That is to say, he had a weak chest and he had the epilepsy. He would have sometimes several attacks a day. Apart from that, he had very short sight. To have bad eyes is not a good thing if you're a painter. 
He suffered from chest complaints, pneumonia, um, and, and bronchitis. He was frequently ill with this. And then there was what he called the morbids, which was depression. In this border region where three countries meet, the Vignatia skirts two enormous lakes, Prespa and Ocrid. Apart from being stunningly beautiful, they are also of considerable geological significance. So uh, when Lear was here, this was all Turkey. In 160 years, of course, it's changed. So which borders have we got here? Albania is somewhere. Uh, Albania is uh, behind that uh, island. We can see this island in front of us. Yeah. It's the uh, biggest island in the lake. Yeah. And uh, just behind the island and on the left side is Albania. And uh, on the, our left side now is Greece. At a magical point in the middle of the lake, all three borders intersect. It's amazing what he did, because he was on a, a mule or, or horseback. He came down here, he went back and up round. He went to a place where he could see both lakes. He went round, back round in order to get to Ochrid. He stayed in Ochrid for a while, and I think then he came all the way back again, round this way. Uh, it was astonishing what he did. It's different when you see his pictures and uh, when you read his writings. Mm. It was seen in his eyes. Sure. It is uh, very, very objective. Yeah. So we learn things that uh, we cannot uh, learn in the history books. He, he was uh, somehow dedicated to himself to, he to, was to do, to yes, to, to do the things that he yeah. that he had planned. Sure. Uh, despite the, all the difficulties that he found around here mm. in the Turkish Ottoman Empire at that time, mm. it was not so safe of, for mm. the. Mm. He was more prepared to me. He had to prepare for four or five months' journey, so cold weather through, through the winter. When he was here, I think it was mid September, so I think it was quite warm and it didn't have too difficult conditions. We think this may be the route Lear would have taken along the old Via Ignatia, through scenery he compared to Cumberland in the north of England. The locals are working hard to encourage tourism here as a source of income, and it is certainly very beautiful. How important is yeah. ecotourism for you? Uh, this is very important for Brajčino. Because I think that the whole world is filled with classic tourism, with massive tourism. She thinks that people all over the world, they are already they have enough of this mass a classic yeah. type of tourism. Sure. The products, where do they come from? They come from Brechino. The sausages, so it's uh, homemade. How? And this uh, juice, this is blackberry juice. Yeah. So, we, they pick in the field, yeah. here in the, the area around the village. Mm -hmm. And the tomatoes and the tomatoes peppers? Tomatoes and peppers and onion, leek. We have the in the garden. In your yeah, garden? Ga in my garden, yes. So everything is, is, yeah. is your pro produce yeah. or maybe from the village? Mm -hmm. We plan to develop the ecotourism. It helps the local population to have a better income, but on the other side, it helps also the nature to stay as it is. Mm. Maybe we should keep it that way as much as we can uh, for the next generation so they can also look at the lake in, with our eyes or with Edward Lear's eyes. Even 160 years ago, maybe he saw the same things that we are looking at. He just would have felt, as we do, I think, just complete delight in it. Maybe that's why he came back twice. Indeed. Well, let's hope that in 160 years' time, people can come here and see the same beautiful view as we are looking at now. Yeah. 
Nadir's regime was arduous, often out at the crack of dawn, traveling up to eight hours, and then drawing in the afternoon. He seemed only truly happy when working intensely or on the move, driven by the desire to see what was over the next hill. But how did Lear achieve such accuracy in his drawings? He would lift his spectacles and take a monocular glass and gaze at the view for several minutes. And then he would draw a tiny sketch of the whole view. It's like a miniature sketch, which he called the totality. And from there, he would make a blow up of the view, taking notes as to the plants that he could not draw, all the names of the plants, the names of the colors of everything that was in the landscape, and uh, the time of day where the landscape was painted. So later on, when he was going to reproduce a watercolor or an oil painting after this first sketch, everything would be accurate. Ocrid, the lake town that inspired this drawing, is my next stop. Lake Ocrid is the Republic's major tourist resort. Popular in the communist days of the undivided Yugoslavia, it is even busier today. But in 1848, many of the 365 churches had been turned into mosques, their frescoes hidden under whitewash. In those days, Ocrid was then regarded as the first town in Albania. Despite his poor eyesight, Lear has left a priceless legacy of fine observation, an accurate depiction of a world that has vanished. The mosque, like Lear's wonderful drawing of it, has survived. Women were washing linen in the lake. When having watched their opportunity and seeing me unescorted, a crowd of the faithful took aim from behind walls and rocks, discharging unceasing showers of stones, sticks, and mud. May my spectacle survive the attack, thought I. As forced into an ignominious retreat, I arrived at the Khan, considerably damaged about the nose and ears, and not a little out of humor. The Church of St. Jovan has been brought back to its former glory. Today is Easter Saturday and the most important weekend in the Christian calendar. As it approaches midnight, the sound of the liturgy rings out across the lake. It has just turned midnight and the church doors have opened. There must be over 5,000 worshippers here to celebrate the resurrection symbolized by the candles. Perhaps this is a symbol of the resurrection of religion itself in a land where churches are being reclaimed and new mosques being built. Easter Sunday in Ocrid is an occasion for celebration and the release from weeks of fasting and restraint. Gorky asked his friend Andriana to show me round Ocrid. Andriana has booked us onto a boat trip round the bay. Edward Lear, when he was here, uh, he said mm -hmm. when he had the trout from here, it was very, very good oh, trout. It's very delicious. Uh -huh. And we can taste it later. Oh, excellent. <laughs> excellent. <laughs> this is what I like to hear. Our jolly companions have come all the way from Montenegro, also once part of the former Yugoslavia. Ah, here 
is the chat. Thank yes. you. Hola. Hola. Yeah, Look at check. that. Awkward trout. Edward Lear would have had an awkward trout, and he did, and he enjoyed it a lot. I'm looking forward to mine. Wonderful. Na zdravie. Na zdravie, thank you. Oh, that is delicious. It is delicious, very delicious. On the western shore of Lake Ockrid lies present day Albania, my next destination. As I leave the old Turkish region of Macedonia, I see Lear landscapes all around me, but the people have changed. Not only are they modern and Western, but the ethnic mix is different. The Ottoman world that fascinated Lear has been largely swept away. I wonder if Albania will tell the same story. Here we are at the border, and like borders everywhere, there's a place to get a cuppa. Time for a good cup of Turkish coffee. We're right on the border in an extremely rowdy cafe. It is the last watering hole before we go into Albania. There are taxi drivers who don't go into Albania, presumably for the same reasons that we have difficulty going to Albania. They bring people up to the border, they, the people cross, and presumably taxi drivers on the other side take them. Those taxi drivers turned out to be ethnic Albanians, and they recognized the places in these Albanian drawings by Lear that will feature in the next leg of my journey. Skadra? Skodra. This Skodra? Skodra, yes. Ah. Skodra. It is the warmth and humanity of chance encounters like this that really inspire one to travel. I'm sure that Edward Lear, with his engaging personality, had he been with me, would have had as much fun. Yes. Thank you very much. This is Albania. Well, another country, another day, another car. Bunkers. More bunkers. How extraordinary. More bunkers. Well, apart from defunct industry and bunkers all over the place, Albania seems to be a very green and pleasant land. <laughs> <laughs> 